let's get started. Hello there, good afternoon. I'm Terrell Ibanez, and welcome to Human Computer Action, the Woolly Mammoth Story. So I'm a UCF alumni, graduated in May, uh, now studying ACI. So what are we gonna talk about today? First, we'll do a little bit about me, my background. Uh, we'll do the story. I'm sure that's what you're all here for. And I'll do a little few tips and tricks on the, uh, on uh, HCI concepts, like uh, cognitive load, Fitz's law, and then go into some more of the practical, I guess, implementation of interaction design. Voice interfaces, augmented reality, and virtual reality, as those are the things I've, I've worked on. So as for my background in HCI, um, I guess I started with uh, the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience, where I interned there when I was in high school, and I made uh, user interfaces for them, for their neural imaging systems. Uh, I learned a lot about what not to do because I didn't have a very formal background in making user interfaces and adding animations just because they look cool actually makes interfaces much, much harder to use, right? It's actually better to have like separate windows that they can drag around and that are more, I guess, convenient for their workflow. After that, and that was, I think, junior year of my high school. So in, when I was a senior, I did, for high school senior design, I did a voice assistant. Um, the, it was a system called uh, SIA, where you could ask it a question, like let's say, uh, who is Thomas Edison? Or what is the Empire State Building? And it would do very, very basic uh, natural language processing where, or I don't know if I would really call it that because they would, I would use, uh, I guess, a part of speech tagging where I would try to figure out what the subject of the sentence was, extract that from the from the question, and then do a, key, uh, a lookup on Wikipedia. Uh, the reason for this is that I discovered that whenever, you know, I was a very curious person, right? And whenever I would search for things, you know, because uh, on a topic like, oh, I want to learn about uh, airplanes or something like that, or like or something that I don't know anything about, like let's say, uh, what is Fitz's law, right? Whenever you go to Wikipedia or go to Google, the first thing that almost always comes up is Wikipedia. And then you go there and then because of the way encyclopedias are written, the very beginning of the encyclopedia article is like a short overview of the article. And then the first line of that is actually, I guess a one sentence description of any topic. And I had designed this before I think Google and Siri had done it, but it's it's a very obvious conclusion. So they, they did end up implementing that like a few years after, or like a year or two after I did that. But it was cool to be the first, I guess. I should have done more with that, but I didn't. Uh, after that, I took uh, human computer action here at UCF. Um, I believe Dr. Wisniewski teaches that, and I learned a lot about mobile UI design and how it's probably the, the probably the easiest way you can do design is to follow existing design guidelines, right? Uh, Google has their material design guidelines, and then Apple has their human interface guidelines on their website. And I think Apple actually, if you've noticed why Apple apps tend to be better is because Apple does actually do more verification on your design guidelines, I think, than then Google does. Uh, after that, I did uh, UCF senior design where I did a a physical project where we did a, a game for an exercise hardware startup. It's a, similar to Peloton. It's a place called Echelon, if you're familiar with it. They make uh, exercise bikes as well. And I believe uh, smart mirrors. And now I think they're adding a rowing machine soon. Or, well, they were on the working on that, maybe. I don't know if they released that yet. So pretend you didn't hear that. Uh, after senior design uh, back in January is when I got my introduction to augmented reality. Um, back at MIT Reality Hack. I got to do augmented reality for air traffic control systems and uh, magically actually really liked the work that I did there. So they sent uh, me a headset to keep working on. And it was, that was pretty nice of them. You know? And that's how I really got my start with augmented reality because um, the equipment for such a thing, for those things is very expensive and I don't think it's something I could have afforded on my own. Um, at uh, Swamp Hacks, I got to try a little bit more of the other side of augmented reality, where we did um, augmented reality for cruise ship navigation, where you're like where you're on a phone and you're trying to navigate around a, or where you have your phone and you're trying to navigate around a cruise ship. So that was more of like the mobile side of AR and what more most people kind of get as an introduction to AR. But if you can try um, 
doing AR with headsets, that's definitely what I recommend. Uh, for Ryerson, for the RU hacks, I got a chance to do um, more physical work where I did a thing where I noticed on one of the, uh, since I'm a really, a really big fan of theme parks, one, on one of the message boards, someone had mentioned that the uh, magic bands that you wear, if you've ever, if you're familiar with those, if you've ever been to Disney World, the magic band that you put on is like a wristband that you can go put on and you can, you know, it's how you get into the park, it's how you like open your hotel rooms, it's how you use uh, fast passes, you know, to skip the lines. Um, oh, they said that all of that is actually standard hardware. It's uh, NFC, or at least it, or like it uses the NFC standard, but they do kind of do their own version of it. And I did some reverse engineering for that. And for RU hacks, I made a a system that encourages people to hand wash when they're in the in the bathroom, right? you know, by having like the system where it'll you would tap in before you start washing your hands, and then it would time you, give you points, and then. Ideally, if I had a lot more time, right, would have implemented something where it would be like a journey throughout the park as you, you know, do that. Um, after that, um, I started studying uh, human kind interaction by doing a graduate certificate in ACI over at Stanford, and I hope to do a master's and PhD eventually. Uh, that's the nice thing about remote. I actually can do that. I'm in Florida right now, but all of the classes, like I just, you know, use the Zoom links for, for for California, right? Um, and the most recent thing I've been working on, uh, UCF has uh, a, a team for the NASA Suits competition. We're going to be prototyping augmented reality interfaces for lunar navigation, EVA, and uh, geology sampling for the future 2024 Artemis moon missions. So that's really cool. Um, but enough about me. That's just a lot of uh, what I've been, but I've, it's, it's just I've been doing HCI for a while now, right? Mostly in augmented reality. Let's get to the story. And it all starts with the woolly mammoth. And 30,000 years ago, right, humans are struggling to survive. But then eventually we learn to communicate. And then from communication, we learn to hunt as a team and we begin to survive together. It takes about 15,000 more years before we end up having any more improvement. But we decide to start recording our knowledge, right? Uh, cave paintings on, on walls. Uh, the only issue with that is, is when we move, the information stays behind, and then we lose it. So if we skip ahead again to ancient Egypt, right? They develop papyrus. So it's kind of like paper, you know? where it allows us to record information in a fairly portable format. And this is where I think that the begin, the dawn of the great civilization begins with this more information. So we jump ahead a little bit more again, and we get to the Phoenicians. So everyone has their own writing system by this point, because everyone has paper. But the thing is that other nations can't understand other nations' writing systems. And so the Phoenicians, who happen to trade with everyone, have this great idea, the solution. Well, why don't we make a common alphabet for everyone? And this allow, and then they then it's in their in their incentive to do so because they do trade, right? And from there we get to ancient Greece, right? So in the ancient Greek, they establish public schools, they invent mathematics. The Romans use this to build a vast the, the things that they've learned from the Greeks to build a vast empire. The Roman Empire initially built those roads for its army, but arguably one of the best parts about having these roads is that they had the first like, connected information network. And it spans, you can see how it, it connects from all the way from like here to Northern Africa and over onto the West. And in 1450, Gutenberg invents the printing press. Because up until this point, we've been painfully copying books by hand. And from there, we can print them instead using the movable type printing press. You set the typing, you know, you put the little, like, I guess, the, the little parts with all the, the letters in and then ink it, and then you can start stamping out page after page, right? And this leads to an explosion of our information capability, and it leads to the Renaissance, right? You know, like Da Vinci and everything like that. 
because of this information. So for, as further advancements in communications happens, we, we skip ahead again. We have the printing press. It kind of leads again to newspapers, which is our first form of mass communication, where we can disseminate information on a large scale to a lot of people. Right? But this takes time. And so we have also the development of telephones, where we have immediate in-time point-to-point communication where I can say something to someone and then someone on the other side of the country will get that information instantaneously. But then we begin to combine those two ideas, right, with radio and television, where we combine the mass impact of newspapers with the immediacy of telephones, right, where someone can say something to everyone immediately. Right, because it's live, live radio and live television, and then with tele, like with radio, and then with television, you can see that happen live. And perhaps the most important thing that you know that people remember about what what television allowed us to do is that it allowed us to see the moon landing, right, live. And so the development of computers is probably the next big jump in information capability, right, where. We had the Apollo, the Apollo guidance computer on the left and on the right, and this is probably, I guess, a little bit earlier, is that uh, for those of you in computer science who are familiar with Alan Turing, uh, his, his work on computation was specifically because they were trying to crack, crack the German Enigma cipher so that we would be able to get intelligence about uh, the German actions during World War II. And it's kind of interesting how far we've come in terms of computing power and how much information we can process at a time. Because when you think about it, a graphing calculator is a very simple computer, right? But a graphing cal a calculator is much, much more, on, on a factor is much more powerful than the Apollo guidance computer. We've made great strides. And since all of you are here and wondering where the, I guess, all what I, what I was trying to get at here is that the progression of humanity has always been the result of better access or processing of information. And at this point with computers now, human computer interaction is the limiting factor. So for those of you, because we're, you know, most of us are from UCF in Orlando, a lot of that is actually taken from the ride spaceship Earth. And then you, if you wanted to see a much more visual aspect of that, you can kind of see, you know, take a little tour physically through communication and information as time goes on. The issue with that ride that I find is that it stops at computers, right? And, but if you take that, the information that you get from this ride and you extrapolate forward, right? You can kind of see both now, the, like the recent present and then on, in the future, right? If you think about it all as information and improving that information, right? So we get mobile computing, right? Where it used to be, you go to a desktop, Right now we've got laptops, tablets, and phones with 3G, 4G, 5G. You get your information on the go. Uh, augmented reality, kind of my specialty. We can overlay information directly on the real world that we didn't have access to before. And then in the future, and we're still kind of working on this, I, I saw a very cool demo that Elon Musk did of the Neuralink demo, where we'll have brain computer interfaces, interfaces which will give us direct information. And to kind of talk about the direct impact of what that will do, I'll give an example, right? So let's say, you know, I'm worried about the weather, right? You know, in Orlando during the summer, in the fall, you know, it rains a lot. So I think, do I need an umbrella? So the old days, you would go to your desktop and you'd go, you know, to the weather website, put in your location and look up the weather reports for where you are now. As it progressed on, you know, you can use your phone now and look it up on your phone and then you can do it while you're, you know, while you're not chained to a desk while you're doing whatever you're trying to do. But then as they added voice interfaces, instead now I can say things like, okay, Google, or hey, Siri, do I need an, uh, do, like, um, what's the weather like today? And it will, you know, tell you about the weather and you don't even have to log into your phone or open it, a website, it'll pick up on context what you're trying to do, right? And then I see that progression of that into the future as being even more, let's say, context sensitive or context aware, right? With augmented reality, like like I think the future will be where we're constantly wearing augmented reality headsets all day, 
and you'll be it'll bring up automatically contextual information so that you know i won't even have to like consider or like uh what do you call it uh i guess consider where let's say if i'm in my house and i'm going towards the door and it'll recognize where i am in my house and recognize that i'm going towards the door and then because it's going outside then it has say like the context awareness to know that the that the weather is going to be bad it'll say oh you're next to the door oh, you know it's going to rain today perhaps you should grab your umbrella and you'll look and then it'll highlight the umbrella next to the door that you should be grabbing right and that's where i kind of see augmented reality being really useful and then with brain computer interfaces it'll just be you know we won't need headsets to do that right and we'll probably be able to do a lot more i think with holograms and there's probably even more information capability that I haven't really thought about yet with brain computer interfaces that because I'm thinking of it in terms of a replacement for an AR headset. But you could probably do a lot more with it because with AR and VR, right? One of the biggest issues that we have is I guess uh, tactile feedback because it's visually presented to you, but the object doesn't really exist. So you can't actually you know touch it. But I believe that brain computer interfaces will solve that problem and will add a whole new dimension into what we can do. So now that I've talked about kind of the importance of HCI and why it's going to be more like the, the field that kind of helps with the progression of humanity and how it's the limiting factor, because now it's just how much information can we give to people? I'll talk a little bit about a few design points of interaction design. So a lot of this will be user interface design, right? Um, there's a thing, there's a concept called uh, cognitive load, where there's a thing called Miller's Law, where people can hold maybe about roughly about seven items in their memory at any given time. Um, they say that about, so that's plus or minus two. So preferably you should try to keep it to five, maximum of nine. And what, what do I mean by this? So, there's a thing called chunking or grouping, where you try to group things together in groups of five or less, so that it's easier to kind of understand numbers or transmit numbers or for that information. You'll see this often, like I say, phone numbers do this, uh, voucher codes. You'll see this in your credit card numbers. Um, you'll often see that, you know, like you kind of try to group related things together. Um, and then something that also helps with that, something called the Hick-Hyman law, where you divide menus into submenus and categories because decisions take longer the more choices you have. Say, for example, that you go to the supermarket. If there were only three types of cereal, that would be a very easy decision to make. But if you've ever been to, say, like Publix, right, and you go down this entire aisle of different choices of cereals and you're just kind of thinking to yourself well oh, which one do i buy because there's so many because you have to consider all of them to be able to make your choice right and a lot of people they just end up you know picking the same cereal every time they go because it's just easier than trying to try and make that decision again because it's so there's so much cognitive load right and when i say cognitive load it's i guess how much work you're trying to make people do and if you try to like i'd say that if you would try to make it so that things are the easiest for people, that there's less friction. Uh, it'll make things a lot better experience-wise. And so one of those ways you can reduce your cognitive load is familiarity, right? Ideally, you should be using familiar design elements. By this point, everyone knows that the floppy disk is the save icon, the magnifying glass is for search, right? But these icons kind of exist because of their familiarity in the real world right where you would used to use uh, i don't know if you remember i don't know how old all of you are and if you remember floppy disks but you would save data on floppy disks and this is how you would transfer information i distinctly remember installing windows with uh, i think 11 floppy disks or 15, 11 to 15 there's a lot of floppy disks right um, or magnifying glasses when you're searching for something these don't always have to have real world, how would I call this, uh, real world analogs, right? Like they call that, I think, skeuomorphism, I'm hoping that's the correct term, where you kind of model things after the real world. There are some things that don't have real world equivalents. Like let's say, if ever you've seen 
what we call the hamburger menu. It's that that icon. I probably should have put a picture of it. Sorry, of the three lines where you have that like if you're trying to find more options. At first, this was a very divisive choice in the community because you know it didn't have an analog, and then people were kind of like, well, what does this icon mean? But now that the hamburger menu has been around for so long, everyone kind of understands it. Okay, more options is the hamburger menu. And you can use that, and it's a very good way of showing, indicating to someone that there are more options available. Right? So let's talk a little bit more about UI. Uh, there's a thing called Fitz's Law, where the distance and the size of a target influence the amount of time it takes to actually select the target. Right? And the key takeaways from that are that closer targets are faster, and bigger targets are fast, faster. Right? Because if you if you don't have to move as far, and if they're very big big targets, they're very easy for someone to to select. Right? There's a very special case to fit this law, uh, where you can use the corners of your screen and not have very large targets at all. But if but the reason for this, and I probably should have put a picture again for this, is that you can kind of you can kind of think about it where that square in the corner that you put in there is actually a much larger square that extrapolate that extends out because whenever you use your mouse and you go to the corner it captures in the in the corner of the screen so then you don't actually have to have them as large because you don't have to be as accurate note that this special case only really applies to user interfaces that use mice or pointing devices like that because when you have, and you notice they don't really do this in, in touch interfaces, that's because there's no captive part to it, right? And so speaking more about touch interfaces, you'll notice that they use larger buttons and the way and the locations of where they put the buttons is, bit, is different from, from user interfaces on computers because of where your, your hands are. Um, maybe if I'll show an example on my phone. Uh, let me use my email. So they have things called uh, floating action buttons, right? Where, because my hand, like if let's say, assume that someone is right-handed, and uh, you probably, okay, I don't think you can actually see that screen. But for those of you who have an email app, you can open it, and then you notice when you you hold your phone, right? There's a button for the most common action, right next to your hand, right, right next to where your your thumb is. That way, it's the easiest and quickest to to pick it. Right. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about voice interfaces, which I've done a little bit. In the old days, and how I did it was, um, and in the old days, you would often call into a bank, and you would say, you would get like, oh, let's say if you want to do, and check your account balance, press one. If you'd like to speak to an agent, press zero. If you'd like to report fraud, press two, and so on and so forth. And they just start reading options after options and options. And if they don't fit all on this page, right, they actually end up having a second menu where you have to press nine for more options. And it's very complicated and very complex because you, you know, like where the Hick Hyman law, you know, nine choices is a lot to be, to be thinking about. And then as you have more and more choices, it's more and more things to think about. So that's why it's kind of interesting now that if you call it to a bank, often instead of having specific voice menus that you work through, they have what are called natural language interfaces, where you can just ask, you know, uh, or the, the the bank will prompt you and say, "Oh, what would I? What can I help you with today?" You can say so and so and so and so, and you can give an example of what you want to talk about or what you what you want to help with. And you only have to answer that once, right? And then instead of having to hear every single option read out to you, you'll get that up, up up front. And the voice system will classify what kind of question or what kind of intent, what do you intend to do, and then redirect you accordingly, right? And sometimes the thing about with, with the thing about with voice interfaces is that sometimes users are vague, right? They'll say that I need help uh, with a deposit or something like that, or like I other what are my deposit, or or let's say um, for, as a better example, like so, let's say at 
like an Amazon Alexa, right? Let's say you can say, can you play some music, right? And it's very vague as to what you mean by that. Do you want to play any music? Do you want to play a random song? Do you want the music you last played? And so sometimes there's like a, there's a thing called slotting where you can define to your interface that there is some required information that you need to be able to follow up on. I guess a better example, let's say, is if you're trying to do something specific, like um, uh, book a trip on Uber, right? Where if you ask a system that, well, Uber's pricing is almost entirely dependent on where you're going. So you it needs a destination. So it'll have a slot for that where it'll ask you a follow-up question for the destination, or if the user wanted to and they understood this, they could say, book a trip on Uber to my grandparents' house. And because the destination's already there, there is no need for the follow-up question. A nice thing to have with voice interfaces, and I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier with augmented reality, is context awareness, where if you know that someone is booking like a flight somewhere, and let's say I want to book, they, they tell them I want to book a flight for Tuesday, right? On uh, to, to France. Let's say there's no flights available to France on Tuesday. So a good way to to solve to work with this is that you would have a you know a follow up uh, context question is like Tuesday is not available, but how about Wednesday? And it'll it'll listen again, and then you can say yes or no if Wednesday, or you could probably answer with a different day, like oh maybe Thursday, and it will follow up on that question. And because the context of you asked about Tuesday, maybe Wednesday will work. For those of you who remember uh, in Microsoft Word, there's a thing called Clippy. And that's probably the worst example of context awareness that people have seen, right? Because it was the problem with Clippy was that it would try to help you, but it would have very, very little understanding of actual context of what you're actually trying to do. And he would just get in the way, right? And I think that Clippy, as an assistant, might not have been so bad if it had just simply been better about context awareness because if you've, if you've seen now, when you go to websites, sometimes you get that little pop-up with the bubble, right? How can we help you today? And boy, um, and they're borrowing from how voice interfaces work, where they can type in a sentence of, say, you know, I need help with my uh, with picking the sunglasses I want to wear, and it'll it'll slot it'll it'll classify that into an intent, and then know how to answer that. Whereas Clippy would try to pick up in, um, context based purely on what you were doing, and that's very difficult. Maybe with machine learning and classification, we'd be able to do that now. But back then, it was just very uh, action-based, where it's just like, oh, if you're you know, opening uh, like a new file or something, it would just try to guess what you're trying to do or give you a list of options of maybe you're trying to do this. But it's trying to be too helpful without really understanding what you're doing. And I think that you know, Clippy, as it is now, would probably work if it was like, say, Cortana, like voice-based, or if you know, you had a typing thing where you could type in your question to Cortana, right? So why don't I talk a little bit more about uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, as I have done some of that. So one of the coolest things that I've seen in, in, in virtual reality is a thing called tomato presence, right? And this is the idea that when you're in virtual reality, right, because you can't see any of the physical world, what they do give you is you know you have your model of your hand but then how do you handle picking up things right you could define you know procedural animations where you know as you pick up things the hands come around it and some some uh, virtual reality games do that i think that new alex games do that but at the time we didn't really have that was very difficult to do so Owl Kemi, the people behind Job Simulator, came up with this concept called tomato presence, where it turns out that if you're, you know, you have a hand and you're trying to pick up a tomato, you can simply replace the user's hand with the object they're holding and then motion track that, right? And um, when you're holding the tomato, right, it feels like you're holding the tomato because it's tracking as if it was in your hand and it's exactly where your hand location is. So it feel it actually feels very natural to do, right? And then more about talking about the hand tracking and the control. Um, when you when you play the original Oculus uh, Oculus Quest, right, and the Oculus Rift, 
they didn't have proper hand tracking, right? You would actually use handheld controllers to do what you do. And then the Magic Leap is actually very similar where you use a controller. While hand tracking is really cool, right? Because it's very visual or very, it's based on visual, a uh, visual video, right? The field of view that you can actually track in is very limited. So your hands actually have to be out in front of you. And if you've ever seen Minority Report with Tom Cruise, you know, you know, messing around with the interface, right? That's actually in human computer interaction, one of the uh, examples of the worst kinds of designs that you can make because when you do hand tracking like that out way out in front of you, it, um, once you, you should try this, it's actually very, very tiring to keep your hands out in front of you for, for so long and continue, right? The beauty of the controller, right, is that because the tracking is not limited to the field of view of the cameras in the front, you don't have to keep your arms out in front of you. You can actually you know, have your hands by your side and you just use the controller and it's actually very natural for that, right? Um, and for more augmented reality work, there's a very big difference between using a headset and the phone, right? With the headset, as I mentioned with the issue with the field of view of the tracking, because augmented reality tracking on a phone is similar, right, where it uses the camera. So the field of view of what you can see augmented reality is actually very limited as well. So you can try to kind of, I guess, the closer your, your phone gets to your person, that works better, but that's kind of, again, you're holding your hands up and it's very tiring. So most users will actually hold their phone and kind of, you know, kind of farther away from them. And that drastically limits the field of what the camera can see and where you can place virtual objects in the world, right? So, and then additionally with, with that, you know, you have your, your hand occupied and then all of your interface, your input typically has to go through the screen. Whereas if you have a headset, you know, you're wearing the headset, you have it, you have both of your hands free, you have, or I guess you can control in one hand. And if you want to do hand tracking, maybe you could if you wanted. But it's just a much better experience. And that's kind of why I lean towards headset-based AR being the future of augmented reality, right? So I think I'm running out of time more because it's been 40 minutes. So I'll go to the next slide. And this will be my last slide. So how, like, one of the things that I think the biggest mistakes that I see that people make for like, augmented reality is they treat it like VR, right? And in VR, you have practically complete control of the world because you're replacing it, right? But because AR is about enhancing the current world because you're overlaying information on the real world, you have to consider the constraints of the real world first. And that with VR, you can just play th place things, you know, virtual objects, you know, like as a video game, and then they just interact with each other and you don't have no consideration for the variety that comes with the real world. But with AR, everything should respect physical boundaries, right? Um, the best example of this that I've ever seen, and you know, if the pandemic ends and I come back to Orlando and some of you see me again, I'm going to, uh, it is so impressive that I want to demonstrate that to you. But there's a thing called Dr. Gorbart's Invaders for the Magic Leap one. And it's probably the best example of augmented reality design that I've seen because it, it respects the physical world. As in, whereas a lot of things, they kind of just float in midair and then you just, you could have done them and you could have, they, these could have been experiences that you could have easily done in VR. Or they don't really, they kind of clip through objects. They don't really consider that. Um, Dr. Goldbart's Innovators actually starts with you physically, you know, like taking the headset and then, uh, you know, looking around the room and scanning the physical option, the physical the physical layout of your room. And at first it seems kind of like, oh, okay, that's interesting. But then you really begin to see the power of this when you start playing the game, because the game is that you have a ray gun, right? You have the, the controller and you're, you're just shooting the robots that are trying to invade your world. And they really are kind of invading your world because they've considered all kinds of things, right? Because they've considered all of the physical objects of the real world and you've scanned and they, they scan the, the room, portals will kind of open up on the ceiling, on the walls. They'll come out, they'll start crawling out of the walls. They'll uh, start you know, coming up from the ground underneath you, like you know, crawling out of portholes there and you'll be shooting them. And because you've scanned your entire room, right? Let's say like I'm shooting at a robot. Um, he can hide behind the couch or like, I think like uh, if you can see here, I have my kitchen. Like when I had this before, like this is an open area. I'll be shooting from my living room into the kitchen and like you can only see half the robot because he's obscured by this. And then that 
is probably one of the most, I guess, well, that's probably one of the best uh, features of augmented reality is if you can treat it so that objects feel like they're in the real world, it becomes a whole lot more immersive, right? Um, I think that owing to more of that design, let's see, um, they have some parts where instead of them just you know coming into your world, they also have a thing where the portal opens up and it's kind of like a doorway into their world that you can't really step into. But then because it, like there's a pathway that leads into it, it kind of feels like it's an extension of the real world, right? And that's, and that's very cool to do. And I think that, let's say if you made um, some other games, you should have one, games that consider the physical layout of the world, where let's say I've considered, and I haven't gotten around to making it, that like if you were to say make um, a tower defense game, if the the you know the enemies were to come around and to navigate throughout your room, if they respect the physical layout of the room, and let's say that like there's a like a tank behind a, a couch, and you can't see the tank anymore because it's behind the couch. Again, this is why I say that they objects should respect the physical presence, right? But anyway, I think I'm running out of time here, so I'll leave it a little bit open, a little bit of extra time for questions. I've got the uh, for questions and answers. I've got my all of my social media and stuff over here, and I have my email addresses. So thanks again to Nighthacks for having me. And does anyone have any questions? Let me move this screen down here so I can actually see the chat if there's any. Hopefully, I'm looking at the right one. Let's see. It's So any questions? I know it was all kind of like a grab bag of different parts of human computer interactions. So and you can just ask anything about it, you know. Well, I'll take that as, let me check if I make sure that someone's asking me an event questions or session. All right, so I think that's about it then. I guess if nobody has any questions, um, thanks for having me and I thanks for coming to my talk. If you have any more questions, if you think of a question later, you can find me on the Discord or send me emails. Have a good one.